Thank you for joining us. My name is Steve Weitzman. I'm a faculty member at the University of Pennsylvania, director of the CAT Center for Advanced Judaic Studies. Um, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to a series that is going to be focused on Jews and the university. Today's program is um, actually part of a larger series, so I hope you will bear with me while I say a few words about the purpose of this larger series and also to offer a few words of appreciation. This series is obviously a response to what has been happening at Penn and other universities this last year. Although I personally was certainly aware of rising anti-Semitism and anti-Israel animus around the globe, if you told me in August of 2023, a mere few months ago, that in the next few months, the Penn campus would soon feel like a very hostile place to many Jewish members of the community, that major donors would withdraw their um, donations, that there would be a congressional hearing, um, and that we would lose a president over this issue, I would most definitely not have believed you. Um, historically, Penn has been distinguished as a place where Jewish life has flourished, and it has re remained so in my experience as a professor here, as director of a preeminent center for Jewish studies research, and as a Penn parent. Um, certainly, we at the CAT Center cannot um, overcome the major social and political forces that are work, at work right now. But what we can do, um, indeed what universities are meant to do, is to ex help expand and deepen understanding. Um, and that is what this series is meant to do in a small way. More specifically, we have three goals. The first is to put the crisis of this current year in the context of a, a larger relationship between Jews and the university in America. In the wake of mass migration from Europe at the beginning of the 20th century, many Jews found in universities like Penn a way into American society a pathway into social integration. Integration. Yes, there was anti-Semitism at many universities. Yes, Jews were excluded from the faculties of places like Princeton and Stanford. And yes, universities like Harvard and Columbia imposed anti-Semitic quotas in an effort to limit Jewish enrollment. But the Jewish desire to learn, um, to go to college, proved stronger than all that um, and uh, actually flourished over the course of the 20th century. In this series, we're going to address the history of anti-Jewish discrimination in academia. We're also going to explore how Jews um, were able to overcome that discrimination. A second goal is to try to get a deeper understanding of the, the current crisis that has erupted at places like Penn and Harvard this current academic year. Looming over everything, of course, is the Hamas attack and the war that has been roiling in the Middle East. And I, and I would imagine that's going to come up at various points in this series, but that is not going to be the focus of this particular program. Our goal in this series is to enlist the help of various kinds of experts to better understand this moment and to investigate what it reveals about um, Jewish life in academia, Jewish studies, academic freedom, uh, admissions policies, and other aspects of university life that have become so fraught and controversial this last year. Which brings me to the third goal. This period has been very painful for Jews. Um, it has also been very painful for universities. Um, you may have seen research showing that American distrust of higher education has been growing in the last few years. And I would argue that what has been happening this year is part of that trend as well. That is part of a backlash against not just professors and university presidents, but against expertise, against certain forms of education, and against the institution of the university itself. So we want to use this series to stimulate some thinking about the future of the university, an institution in which Jews have invested a lot and have a lot at stake. So just a few words of thanks before we introduce our wonderful speaker this afternoon. Today's program is made possible by a grant of the Goldhirsch Yellen Foundation. And I want to express my support, uh, my appreciation for the support of uh, the foundation and its director, Elizabeth Goldhirsch Yellen, um, thanking her for giving us a new way to support new research and, prog and public programming on anti-Semitism. Um, all our pro public programs are made possible by the support of the Klatt family and the Harry Stern Family Foundation. Um, and for this series, we are grateful to them and also grateful to the co-sponsorship of the Weizmann National Museum of American Jewish History, um, which is doing so much to help the CAT Center reach a much broader audience than we could reach on our own. Last but not least, I want to thank the staff of the CAT Center, especially um, Dr. Anna Albert, Director of Public Programs for the CAT Center, that, who you'll be meeting in a, later in the program, along with Diana Dennis-Walters, -Wal uh, who are, is our ever-resourceful events coordinator. In terms of the program, just a few words about how things are going to unfold. Um, we're going to, uh, I'm going to introduce in a moment our guest speaker. She will be speaking for about half an hour, and then there will be time for questions and discussion. 
Um, the way webinars work, as I'm sure many of you know, is that you can use a Q&A function at the bottom of the screen um, to submit questions. Um, and then um, our Director of Public Programs, Ann Albert, is going to appear at this, on the screen for that part of the program. And she will moderate um, the discussion and ask some of the questions on your behalf. So with that, it is now my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, Dr. Pamela Nadell. Professor Nadell is a scholar of American Jewish history and gender history who is the author of several important books that include um, America's Jewish Woman, A History from Colonial Times to Today, a winner of the National Jewish Book Award, among other honors that have been bestowed upon Dr. Nadell's work. Um, in addition to her scholarship, she is um, a universally revered member of the Jewish Studies academic community, an award-winning teacher, past president of the Association of Jewish Studies, which is a major academic society for Jewish studies. And of course, you might recognize her from her appearance at a recent and somewhat infamous congressional hearing where I believe she was the only witness, uh, someone who did not uh, leave with her reputation uh, scathed in any way. Uh, when I learned that Dr. Nadell is currently working on a book about the history of anti-Semitism in America, I knew we definitely had to begin this series with her, and it is my pleasure now to welcome her to our virtual stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Weitzman, um, for the, that very generous um, introduction. And I just want to make sure, can you all see my screen? I'm hoping that you can. Um, I was told that if you couldn't, yes. there would be something, somebody would come on and tell me. Um, so, and I also want to thank uh, Diana Dennis Walters for her excellent arrangements. Um, I Opening this series and listening to Professor Weitzman's discussion of the reason for this series really brought me in many ways to the subject that we're going to talk about today. But he said that, um, you know, if you'd asked him in August of 2023, what was going to happen at Penn in the fall semester of 2023, he would have been astonished. I think I'm less astonished. And that's because of what I've been working on for so many years. So I really want to talk about, and I thought it would be a great way to kick off this series, would be to talk about um, the how American Jewish historians have thought about the study of anti-Semitism. And so I want to begin by mentioning two books. The last really superb history, overview history, of anti-Semitism in America was Leonard Dinerstein's book written in 1994. It was a book that showed us many examples about the depth and breadth of anti-Semitic invective, prejudice, discrimination uh, against Jews in the United States. And then, as you can also see on your screen, in 2000, another scholar published a book and he called it The Death of American Anti-Semitism, a title that will probably live on in infamy given the world that we're living in. The truth is, is that relatively little had been written about American anti-Semitism, about the history of American anti-Semitism since those books. But in 2010, Professor Tony Michaels wrote an article that's been very influential in the field. It asked, is America different? And it was a critique of American Jewish exceptionalism. And the exceptionalist view is that Anti-Semitism was just not all that significant in the American Jewish experience. Um, the fact that it rarely turned violent, there was the sense that it never came from the government, it never came from public policy. And mostly people talked about anti-Semitism in American Jewish historiography as something that was social. And social doesn't sound nearly as serious as something that is official and governmental. The problem, according to Professor Michaels, was that we were using a maximalist definition of anti-Semitism. So if we wanted to compare anti-Semitism in America to Europe, well, America has never thankfully had genocide um, and hasn't had large scale pogroms. In 2012, Professor Dinerstein, oh, sorry, there it is. Professor Dinerstein went back and he revisited what he had written in 1994. And I find this quotation really, you know, in today's world, really astonishing because in 2012, he published this and he published it again 
at the beginning of 2016. And he said, the plague of anti-Semitism, and the italics are his, not mine. Most American Jews don't see it, feel it, or fear it. And he continued, anti-Semitism is too minor an issue to disturb the daily lives of American Jews. Well, one year later, there was the rally, the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, in August of 2017, where the um, white nationalists had planned in advance that when they would march through the campus of the uh, University of Virginia, that they would be chanting, Jews will not replace us. And they had planned that they would use torches, um, torch lights, um, echoing the, these images look like Nazi stormtroopers through the streets of Germany in the 1930s. And a year after that, a gunman murdered 11 Jews in worship and injured another six at the Tree of Life Synagogue in Pittsburgh. I should tell you that that building is currently being demolished um, and a new building will go up and it will include what I believe will be the first history of anti, uh, the first museum dedicated to the history of anti-Semitism in America. But, and this is why um, I, I understand why Professor Weitzman wasn't surprised. This is why I wasn't surprised about the campus. This is an image of Israel Apartheid Week at Columbia University, but it's from 2016. And I could give you oodles of examples of um, anti-Israel sentiment emerging on college campuses from 2016 and earlier. So it was this moment that led several American Jewish historians to convene a working group at the American Jewish Historical Society, which is one of the partners at the Center for Jewish History in New York. And I should remind you, this was before COVID, right? So they were meeting in person. I don't live in New York. I live outside of Washington, D.C. And yet I and a number of others managed somehow to be conferenced in to join the conversation. And my notes on that first meeting show that we opened it by speaking personally. We were talking about how we felt a sense of personal and professional crisis since Charlottesville. So since we're historians, since we actually continue to believe in the importance of context and complexity, I will continue to use the word context. So we spent a lot of time talking about definitions. We, we talked about definitions and terminology. We, as scholars, have concerns about using one word, anti-Semitism, a word not coined until the 1870s, um, using it to describe all forms and expressions of anti-Jewish hate. Um, and we also began to talk about, well, why is there no scholarship? What, what's out there? You know, what, 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 can we, what can we point to to help us understand? So we knew that Steve Oney had written a terrific book on the Leo Frank trial and lynching. We knew that Stephen Ross had written a fine book called Hitler in Los Angeles, How Jews Foiled Nazi Plots Against Hollywood and America. And there's another book on this subject as well. And what it showed is that in the 1930s, when there were Nazis who were in America who were supported by funding coming from Nazi Germany, how um, a man named Leon Lewis ran a spy ring to infiltrate those groups and uncover their plots, which would have included, if they had their way, murder that would have sparked pogroms. And we also knew that there was another really good book by Joseph Bendersky called The Jewish Threat, Anti-Semitic Politics of the U.S. Army. But for historians of American Jewish history, most of us who were in that room are members of the Academic Council of the American Jewish Historical Society. We, what jumped out was that none of those books that I just mentioned were written by people who were in that room. They're not people that we would identify as part of our cohort of American Jewish historians. They're excellent historians, but, they're, but they come from wider American history. And so what we realized was as American Jewish historians, we had not been paying attention to anti-Semitism. 
And I think that the reason because of this is how Salo Baron, the preeminent Jewish historian of the 20th century, former, um, he was, a, in his lifetime, he was a professor at Columbia University. Baron had railed against, and actually spent his entire life fighting against historians writing what he called the lacrimose conception of Jewish history. And by that, he meant that the tearful, lacrimose, tearful conception that what we'd been focusing on or what earlier historians had focused on were the attacks in the Crusades and the attacks during um, the bubonic plague and the and obviously um, the pogroms. And what he wanted us to write about was the vibrancy of Jewish life and um, and to talk about how. Um, Jews had been creative, how they'd been actors on their own, and for us to see that this lacrimose, the conception, these events, they periodically disrupted Jewish life, but they weren't the determining factors of Jewish life. So as historians, we, as American Jewish historians, we had really left the writing of anti-Semitism in American history to the books that I just mentioned and to a few post-war scholars. Um, the first of them was John Hyam. And John Hyam is really the person who co coins the idea about social anti-Semitism. So Jews in the 1870s and the 1880s coming into the United States, these are years of great migration, but there's also a well-established Jewish community. They were they they were experiencing rapid economic mobility. They wanted to live in the same neighborhoods. They wanted to go to the same resorts the Gentiles went to. And so you see here a cartoon from this era where the clerk is turning away a man from a hotel and the tourist says to him, yes, yes, I know all your orders, but how was it do you know I wasn't a Christian? So th this is the beginning of the exclusion from hotels, um, but also from other places, the social anti-Semitism. A different historian named Richard Hofstetter, he actually argued that the anti-Semitism of the late 19th and early 20th century traced back to a political movement called populism, which argued that agrarian economic woes um, were at, were blamed on international Jewish financiers, particularly the Rothschilds, and that Jews had become the scapegoats for the movement's failure. And here you see in a cartoon from 1896, um, uh, history repeats itself. That's the name of the cartoon at the bottom. If you look at the top of the cross, you will see it says, this is the U.S. in the hand of the Jews. And what are they doing? They're crucifying Uncle Sam the way they crucified Jesus. So there was another, another theme that emerges in this very same time period. And that was, it's actually where the phrase Jews will not replace us is coming from, is here is a cartoon showing how the Jews have come into America and what are they doing? They're lowering the sign on the store that you know John Smith has had his store there since 1820 and they're slow and they're putting on a sign that is that that shows that it's going to be you know a Jewish store and if you look around you will see that you know it's the Jerusalem Tribune rather than the New York or the Jerusalem Herald rather than the New York Tribune so we we had kind of this was where what we knew about anti-semitism it starts really in America in the 1870s, 1880s, 1890s. And we really hadn't paid much attention other than Dinnerstein's terrific book. So we were writing about all sorts of other topics um, from, from Penn, from the University of Pennsylvania, Beth Wenger wrote a terrific book about Jews in the Great Depression. And I was writing a book, um, as Professor um, Weitzman mentioned, I was writing a book called America's Jewish Women, a history from colonial times to today. And what it what jumped out at me in, in that book is that I, I didn't really think that I was writing about anti-Semitism. But when I was on book tour, I started talking with uh, a colleague and he said, it's all over your book. So I, I was really kind of, I was really kind of struck. And I went back and I thought, 
okay, I guess he, I guess he's right. I'm really have been like in every single chapter, I ended up talking about how American Jewish women had encountered anti-Semitism. So that began, it, it set my thinking that maybe I needed to focus on, on that topic a bit more. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to talk a little bit personally about how this turn, the, the current, the current events forcing me as a historian to think about American anti-Semitism, how it actually impacted my teaching, my scholarship, and my uh, work as a public intellectual. So I'll start here. I began for the first time teaching a course on the history of anti-Semitism in 2020, in the spring semester of 2020, so four years ago. So coming on the heels of that workshop at the Center for Jewish History, coming on the heels of Charlottesville. Now, I had for a long time, I had taught the history of anti-Semitism as part of a year-long course on the civilization of the Jewish people. I also actually annually, I'm the person on the faculty who teaches the history of the Holocaust, one of the people on our faculty. Um, but I de decided that I was going to develop a freshman seminar on anti-Semitism, enduring hatred. I divided the syllabus into three sections. They were, what is anti-Semitism? From anti-Semitism, from anti-Judaism to anti-Semitism, because remember I said the word anti-Semitism doesn't pop out until um, the 1870s. And then I had a whole section built around what Professor Michaels had been challenging us to say, you know, is America different? Um, the, in the class, I do two things. The first is that the students read Ambassador Deborah Lipstadt's terrific book, Anti-Semitism, Here and Now. And I really recommend this for those of those of you on the Penn campus, but also far more widely. Um, Deborah Lipstadt, of course, was a professor at Emory University, and she since then has become the U.S. Special Envoy um, to combat anti-Semitism overseas with the title, with the um, at the rank of ambassador, which required a Senate confirmation hearing. She also testified in the civil trial that charged those planning the um, the events in Charlottesville, charged them um, under a, a, actually a 19th century law and um, which the lawyer Roberta Kaplan won. So she testified there on what anti-Semitism is and how it is figured in um, world history and in American Jewish history. And it's, it's really accessible because it's written as a, a conversation. It's written as a series of letters between a student and a faculty member and Professor Lipstadt. And so my students find it really accessible as a way to understand the very different manifestations anti-Semitism has taken in the past and in the present. The second thing that I do in the course, which I started four years ago, as I said, was the students have to give oral presentations on current events. I know it sounds a little bit like third grade, but the, I asked them to find four news stories about anti-Semitism and then to share those with the class. And when I created the course, I thought, well, maybe there won't be anything and there won't be any news to share and then I'll just get rid of that assignment. Well, of course, that didn't happen. It um, it, the the anti-Semitism since the spring of 2020 has just gotten worse and worse in America and around the world. But anti, but I also, it wasn't only my teaching that was impacted by this rise in anti-Semitism. It's been my scholarship. So as I said, um, I. I didn't realize how much I'd written about anti-Semitism in America's Jewish women. And so that propelled me to think about, well, what do we know about anti-Semitism and gender? Because I work on gender. And I ended up doing quite a bit of research and writing a, um, a public lecture, lecture that's part of the series at the University of Michigan, their Bellin lectures. And it's called, It Can Happen Here, anti-Semitism, gender, and the American past. 
And we can talk in the Q&A if you want about some of the things that I concluded then about how gender really impacts the experience of anti-Semitism. But it also currently led me to the book project I'm working on now, and that is a book titled Anti-Semitism and American Tradition. And if I make my deadline, it will appear in 2025. So wish me luck. Um, it also impacted my role as a public intellectual. I was one of the thousand experts and community leaders consulted as um, government leaders were developing in May 2023, the US national strategy to counter anti-Semitism. This is a remarkable document. You can find it online. It's the first time I think that any nation has said that they need to have a strategy to counter anti-Semitism. It's also part of the reason why I wasn't surprised about how much it ratcheted up on campuses after October 7th. So it's 60 pages. It's filled with recommendations of steps for the government and for what it calls whole of society to take, to respond to, and we hope mitigate this form of hate that has been um, surging in our nation and also frankly around the world um, really for decades. Um, one of its four pillars seeks to increase awareness and understanding of anti-Semitism and broaden appreciation of Jewish American heritage. And I'm thrilled that the Weizmann Museum of American Jewish History is co-sponsoring today's lecture. Um, I actually uh, have been involved with that museum since its inception um, in, in its current iteration. And we do have, I mean, we know this, American Jewish historians know this, um, May is Jewish American Heritage Month, and it's been proclaimed that since 2004. Um, but we are right now in the midst of Black History Month, and I see a lot more about Black History Month than I, uh, that comes through various news feeds I get than I do see about Jewish American Heritage Month. So I think it'll be very important as a way of understanding anti-Semitism as a factor in the American Jewish experience for a greater focus on that. And then, of course, there was that hearing with the presidents. So I've testified before Congress three times. The first time was in 2017, just three months after Charlottesville. And it was a hearing about whether or not Congress should legislate the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance definition of anti-Semitism. And I, I'm open to all these different definitions of anti-Semitism. I actually subscribe to a, a very succinct definition that I use to inform my thinking about the book I'm writing. But um, this was my first experience, didn't really know what I was going in, into. And I, I just, I will share with you my favorite moment from that hearing. Um, so it was, there There were two professors involved in the hearing and there were a bunch of Jewish organizations and also Pan America and a lawyer. And we were all witnesses at the table. And one of the um, witnesses from a Jewish organization, he turned to the Congresswoman he was talking with or the Congressman he was talking with. And he said, inviting the professors was like inviting people from the Flat Earth Society to a hearing about NASA. And I just loved that comment. Um, witnesses are not supposed to address each other, um, but it also, since we were talking about an attack on higher education um, in Professor Weitzman's opening remarks, here it was there, it was right there. So I wanna tell you a little bit about what goes on in these hearings, because I think most people don't know them. And I think everybody who's on here probably saw the clip that went viral. But here's what I, what I see. First of all, because I, I also testified in November of this year, not just in December. So these hearings are public performances. They're actually very carefully scripted. For me, the most important part is the chance to submit written testimony which then lives on forever and which can actually say something important. So the testimonies that I wrote in November and December this year were about the history of anti-Semitism, about its role in the American past and present, 
And I should tell you that they were about eight to 10 pages, single spaced with footnotes. But then when you go into the hearing as a witness, you get five minutes to summarize your written testimony. Well, a five minute summary of 10 pages single spaced it comes down to three pages double spaced. So you don't get to say very much about what you what you were, you know, what you've written and what you think Congress needs to know. So then the hearing goes back and forth between the majority party and the minority party, and each member of Congress gets five minutes. And it and two things happen. Sometimes they just talk for five minutes and nobody on at the witness table gets a question. Sometimes they talk for three and a half minutes, pose a question, and the witness basically has 60 seconds to answer. Um, they can also, and this is what happened in December, if they speak for only part of their time, they can also yield the rest of their time to another member of Congress, which is exactly what happened um, as they, and it was all planned in advance that when we came back at, after we started the hearing at 1030 in the morning, we came back around 3, 315 after a, a break while people went to vote. And they had planned that they would speak and they would yield a minute or 90 seconds back to Elise Stefanik so that she could continue um, to drill and go after the precedents. So the clip that went viral that day um, came at the tail end of this long day. The precedents had already denounced anti-Semitism. They had already passed the political litmus test of saying that they supported Israel, but then they got hammered. So if you really want to know what happened that day, take a look at the uh, at the bottom of this slide. I've pasted actually the um, the URL link and you can read a transcript of the entire five plus hours. And a lot more was going on there than um, than happens in a, a clip that goes viral. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop sharing. Apologies for looking over there where I was sharing. And I'm looking forward to being joined by Ann Albert. And we're going to have a question and, and kind of focus on some of the Q&A that you have posted, hopefully, in the Q&A um, on the screen. Thank you so much for that. Um, what an amazing short resume of the history of approaches to, to American anti-Semitism. Thank um, you. Thank you. So yes, we do already have some questions, and I just want to encourage people to submit um, to submit them now as they come to you as well. Um, I want to start actually um, with some of the sort of policy-oriented material that you that you ended with, because a couple of people are asking more about the development of and uses of the U.S. national strategy to combat anti-Semitism. So to begin with, could you tell us a little bit more about what role academics, historians, scholars of various stripes played in creating that strategy, uh, what discussions were had, and what mm -hmm. approaches were discussed? Right. Um, so the first thing I would say is that in um, December of 2022, the White House announced that they were going to develop, and I don't remember the exact title, if it's a task force or exactly what it was, but they were going to um, respond to the rising hate in this country. And and they it's the um, announcement that came from uh, the press secretary said that they would begin by developing a national strategy to combat anti-Semitism. And I was told that they're now working on a national strategy to combat Islamophobia. Um, uh, so, but I, I not involved with that. So I haven't, I, I, but that's what I kind of heard through the grapevine. So they, um, a, a number, I, I forget exactly who was put in charge of uh, developing the national strategy. But they began reaching out to people who they thought were essentially experts or stakeholders in this. And they reached out. It was really astonishing and very encouraging. They reached out to quite a large number of Jewish studies professors. Um, I, the only reason I know that is because we were we we met um, 
we were under chart chart house rules. You couldn't talk about. I, I couldn't. I cannot say anything other than what I con contributed to that conversation. Um, but we we had you know lengthy, serious conversations, and I know people. Like I was in a group of you know maybe eight or ten people, and I know that there were other scholars who were also tapped. I'm sure there were Jewish communal organizations, Jewish communal leaders. I imagine you know religious leaders, but I remember actually learning even before the publication that the scholars had had an impact, that they were determined that because we had been pushing that, or I was pushing um, that we needed to pay attention to Jewish American Heritage Month. And we needed to talk not just about the Holocaust, that wasn't the solution. We needed to talk about American history. And that appeared in the point that I just made um, from the from the guide. Thank you. Yeah, that is useful. That leads into the next question, um, which was whether you've seen elements of that strategy really been uh, having been rolled out to good effect since it appeared. Um, are we seeing a much impact? Or what kind of activity is coming out of that enterprise? So, so one of one of the recommendations in that guide is um, it has a whole section on education, and one of the recommendations on education is that they need to educate and 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 ed educate universities but also educate students and faculty about title 6 and title 6 of the 1964 civil rights act allows for um allows for actions in the office of civil rights in the department of education when students feel that they have been discriminated against based on shared ancestry that's the interpretation of that goes back actually to the Obama administration. And as we know, I think at last count, since October 7th, more than 60 Title VI violation complaints have been filed with the Office of Civil Rights in the Department of Education. Um, I imagine there's probably one at Penn, but there's certainly one at my university. Um, and they, and, and of course there is, you know, there there's a, a problem with this because that office hasn't been well funded and it's grossly understaffed and it will take a long time for these actions to wend their way wend their way through. But but the Department of Education has held meetings with colleges and universities to talk about this and is trying to get the word out about Title VI. Great. Um, we have some a few different questions in different ways um, being submitted about um, your comments that you know you were only able to say out loud and have televised a small portion of what you actually submitted. If it's not an unfair thing to ask, can you can you give us some sense, some characterization of what you think was left out, what you weren't able to to confer in that brief that brief appearance that we might understand a little more deeply here? So the first thing I would say is you can you can read the testimony. I put it up on my personal website, um, but it also somewhere on the congressional website you can find it. Um, the first thing that I would say is that I gave many, many more historical examples. So I, I and I talked about some of the major themes of anti-Semitism, which are still around today. So one of the things that I emphasized, and I, I don't think you can begin to understand anti-Semitism in the United States without understanding Christian anti-Judaism. And um, I don't remember if I said this in in that report, but but some of you may remember that um, it's really just a year ago, right? A year, a little bit more than a year ago, Kanye West, yay, had um, tweeted something about about the Jews um, at, that was anti-Semitic, and in over Highway 405 in Los Angeles. There was a anti-Semitic group. They call themselves the Goyim Defense League, and they posted a banner over the highway, and it said, "Honk if you think Kanye was right." And then what nobody paid attention to, and actually in some news reports got blurred out, was at the end of the banner there was um, a, 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 a sign saying, "Rev," I think it's eight colon nine or three nine, and and. John and eight colon 44. And the references to um, passages in the New Testament that talk about Jews worshiping in the synagogue of Satan and that their father is the devil. 
So you can't understand anti-Semitism in America without understanding Christian anti-Judaism. So I talked about that. I talked about the classic tropes about Jews moving sort of from Judas selling out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver to Shylock, who of course was fictional, to the Rothschilds, to George Soros. Um, so I talked about the way in which old anti-Semitic ideas morph and change in the contemporary scene. Um, we have also a number of questions that are really about the definition of anti-Semitism. I think your answer just now sort of sort of leads us into this. Um, I'll ask maybe a few in succession, but but the first one is really simple. You suggested that you use a kind of short um, version of a definition and people are curious what that definition is and how you came to work with that one in particular. So I have, and I don't have it right in front of me. I have um, a short definition that I is based on a document that was created at Michigan State University by a number of scholars, including Yael Aronoff and Kirsten Vermeglish. And they created a guide for understanding anti-Semitism for the Michigan State University community. And with their permission, I essentially adapted that guide and created one for the American university community. And their definition, said, but I use their definition and their definition, and I can't quote it, it is on the Jewish studies program website at American University. It, it, it's basically about prejudice, discrimination, um, even violence against Jews and Jewish institutions. My I, When I teach the history of anti-Semitism, I talk with my students about, we, we look at a bunch of different definitions. Um, one of my favorites is um, uh, attributed to, I forget who, um, and it's uh, uh, anti-Semitism, it's something like, it, it's, it's Isaiah Berlin, and something like anti-Semitism is hating Jews more than necessary. So I use that one. Um, and I, and also I've been influenced by the New York Times columnist, Brett Stevens writing, and for him, anti-Semitism, like all anti-Semitism goes back to conspiracy theories. And I, a lot of people are saying that now that they're, that if we, we you know, the Jews conspired to kill Jesus, the Jews conspired, um, to poison the wells during the black plague, that all anti-Semitism is essentially rooted in conspiracy theories. So I'm not, I don't have one definition and I had a nice talk with my editor about what do I do about this? And I'm just gonna like have an opening note and and at the beginning of the book and saying here are all these definitions, but truthfully scholars fight about them and I'm not gonna argue about them. Um, if you don't mind talking about it, I wonder in that connection, how, how, do you have any useful way of approaching the question of anti-Israel sentiment or anti-Zionism as part of this field of anti-Jewish prejudice? So of course, this is the big question animating campuses. Um, at my university, we have actually just prohibited demonstrations inside buildings. And we have also just declared that our student organizations must be open and welcoming to all organizations and uh, all students on campus, um, uh, and that they, you know, their their work and their statements must fit their purposes. Um, we'll see how well that goes over. Um, I, we, I, what I can say is, I look. If I had an answer to this, I'd have a different job, right? <laughs> I wish I had an answer. That's why I asked it like I did. Do you yeah. have? way of approaching it <laughs> right um but i but i do i do feel that we have hit a, an inflection point in the united states not just not just on campus where it's okay to say certain things about jews that no one would ever ever be able to say about any other minority group not at least not in the circle of the university and um, what I what I would remind people, because everybody has gone after the campus, and of course on the campus we live in kind of a hotbed and we're all living together, I would remind people that last week or the week before there were um, protesters outside New York's Memorial Sloan Kettering Hospital, and they were protesting the fact that a Zionist 
um, had given uh, maybe $400 million to the hospital. That This is going on everywhere, but the campus is under attack. Um, and it's been under attack for a long time. It, this, this has become a way of getting at the campus by using anti-Semitism. Thank you for that. And just in the same vein, one more question, turning more to you as a, as a historian and less as a commentator on our, on our present moment. Um, there are some questions about this word anti-Semitism. You mentioned that it was first coined in the 1870s. I think many, many of us, um, unless we've studied the history, that doesn't necessarily occur to us. So can you, can you teach us a little bit about where this term came from and how it came to mean anti-Jewish sentiment more broadly, even though it's specific? Oh, it's so great you asked that. <laughs> you know, because I, 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 I was someplace I can't remember where. Oh, it was at Congress, and I was talking to um, one of the lawyers um, who had invited me, and he said, "Wow, and 1879? That's crazy. I had no idea that the word is so recent." Um, so, anti. I I talked earlier about um, anti-Christian or Christianity's animus towards the Jews which would have gone under different names, um, anti-Judaism, um, Judeophobia. I mean, we have all these different different names that are used, but that was based on religion. And theoretically, Jews could resolve the problem by becoming Christian. They could, they could, they could see the light. So in 1936, the Christian Century, a mag uh, important magazine for mainline Protestantism, it, you know, it says nobody would ever accuse us of anti-Semitism, but Israel needs Jesus to complete its mission. And so, you know, we still have those kinds, those kinds of things. But in the 18, by the 1870s, we have new ideas about what constitutes Jewish identity and that they're seen as a racial group. And this is really what Nazism grows right out of. And a, um, a, a man named Wilhelm Marr in Germany, he decided that he needed a different word because his opposition to Jews was based on blood and race, not based on religion. And what he did was he looked at what um, linguists had done. They had classified a category of languages descended from uh, that are descended from the Middle East, Hebrew, Arabic, Aramaic, and they called them the Semitic languages. And so he took from that the notion, well, there must be Semitic peoples. And he came up with the phrase anti-Semitismus. And I was able to find actually, so he coins it, he, he founds a, a German League of Anti-Semites. He begins to popularize it, although it's possible somebody did even earlier, but Certainly by 1879, it's known. And I was able to find that by 1880, it's already emerged in the United States, that it, it, it gets translated into English. Of course, it's spelled differently than we spell it now. There's, you know, we don't only argue about definitions, we argue about spelling. So it was spelled with a hyphen and a capital S. But now we tend to spell it with no hyphen, no capital S, because there is no such thing as a Semitic people. Yeah, that, that is a relatively recent shift, but it is, and it may not be one that reads to people sort of outside the small circle of, of scholars, but um, by the significant. Um, okay, switching gears a little bit, we also have a number of questions about your more recent, uh, your work on gender um, and your more broad historical work. So first of all, a lot of people said, yes, please do talk about how um, gender impacts the experience of anti-Semitism, what you've seen, what, what can you tell us about that? So what, what, what happened was when I was on book tour and started to think about this, I started to ask people um, in, my, in the audience, this was like before everything, before I, we all moved to Zoom, I was in person. And I asked if they had had experiences with anti-Semitism. And I was astonished Half a century later, they would be describing to me with unbelievable passion something as if it had happened yesterday, that that they had encountered anti-Semitism and it had effect it, it was a memory that they carried, they carried across their lives. And so I began, so when I, I started to think about anti-Semitism and gender, I was looking to see, well, 
what do women experience? How do they experience anti-Semitism? And, um, and how do they respond? Because I was so taken with those, the power of those responses. And I saw that women, because women in, in the middle class ended up not being out in public in the same way that men were, they weren't going to the hotels unless they were accompanying their husbands or they weren't out in the workforce where they experienced anti-Semitism was up close and personal. They experienced it through their children. They experienced it through their relatives. They experienced it in a personal encounter with a shopkeeper. And that, that was what shaped them. And I, um, I in, in that article that I published, um, or that public lecture that I published is kind of longer than an article, I talked about a woman who in the during World War II was convinced that the minute the US entered the war, anti-Semitism would disappear. And she wrote an article in a, a magazine, short-lived magazine in New York. And she talked about the anti-Semitism that her family had faced, including, and I know you're going to talk about this later in this series, um, her son, he he wanted, he, he, he liked science. He wanted to become a chemist, but it's 1943 and there's no way he's going to get a job as a chemist. Well, then he wanted to become a physician, but their quotas on the medical schools and what Jewish men had been doing for decades after those quotas came in was they'd been going to Europe to get their medical education. The war's underway and he can't do it. And she talked about a relative who was a nurse maybe out on the island, Long Island somewhere, and who had to, she couldn't work at the hospital in the town where she lived, even though it's the wars going on. She had to go to a hospital somewhere that would take a Jew. Thank you. Um, we have uh, one question that I actually want to, to just read. Um, someone wrote in, historians study, among other things, change over time. Right. What are the things that contribute to the ebb and flow of anti-Semitism in the U.S. over time? So it seems to me this person writes that it's been more or less latent over the decades. And so I want to give you this general question to see if you can talk a little bit about the um, the, the broad changes that you see right. in American Jewish history. So the first thing that I would I would say is it's a great question. The first thing that I would say is anti-Semitism spikes in times of trauma and conflict. And so the anti-Semitism that's been spiking in America since 2016, 2017 is a result of what's going on in the United States more broadly at, at the moment. Um, and anti-Semitism in the United States has followed that trajectory. So anti-Semitism historians have often called the period um, of World War II, uh, this is Leonard Dinerstein called the period of World War II, the high tide of American anti-Semitism. Um, others of us have said it's really between World War I and World War II. Um, and these are moments of rapid change. And then of course the great crisis of the depression and then the war. So that's true. I definitely do see anti-Semitism changing over time in the United States and taking on new manifestations. It's also, it's not only it's not only when it rises, it's also how it's expressed and who expresses it. One of those changes that many people are pointing, several people are pointing out in, in questions is a shift perhaps, or a perceived shift from a predominantly Christian oriented form of anti-Judaism or anti-Semitism to one that is coming more from Muslim groups and also from black communities. Right. Um, can you speak to that, whether it's a, an actual demonstrable shift out in the world or only perception, and what are the factors that are that are making this happen? The volume of the shift has changed, but what people don't remember is that the disruption of what had once been a very strong um, African-American um, Jewish civil rights coalition dates to 1967 and dates to when these ideas that we're seeing amplified today when they first entered um, the, the academy and entered these communities. So yes, there's a shift in terms of volume, but the ideas go back earlier. Is, um, is it useful to 
think of anti-Semitism as a kind of racism or as having a racist component, um, either useful in terms of understanding anti-Semitism better and helping to combat it, or else perhaps useful in terms of helping to form intersectional coalitions and, um, and find support from other quarters. Yeah, well, first of all, anti-Semitism, not only is it a form of racism, but when the word racism, racism really begins to get used, um, in especially in the 30s, it's applying to what's going on to the uh, happening to the Jews in Germany. Um, so I, I do think, and I, I do, you know, I hope that we can we build alliances with those who are engaged in anti-racist work to recognize that um, anti-Semitism needs combating anti-Semitism needs to be part of their mission. Thank you. I think I'll just um, I'll just put one more question to you, um, which is an amalgam of uh, again of some questions that have come in, which is about um, following on this thread of intersectionality. Whether you're finding either at your own university or in your contacts um, and your travels and and speaking around the country, that uh, useful working groups, coalitions. Um, um, connections are happening across scholarly boundaries um, in today's, today's university. So I would say, you know, first of all, I'm on sabbatical, so I haven't been out. <laughs> I'm sitting at home writing, which is great. Um, I, there are places where that have been held up as models. At Dart, what, the conversation that happened at Dartmouth University right afterwards um, has been held up widely as a model, even was, you know, uh, on 60 Minutes. So there are places, um, there needs to be more. That's about the best I could say about it, yeah. That's wonderful, thank you. I think we'll wrap up there. I wanna thank you so very, very much uh, yeah. for bringing such depth and breadth to this conversation and kicking us off with a, with a really strong, um, set of observations to be going forward with in this series. And I want to thank our, our Cat Center Director, Steve Weitzman, for organizing this whole thing and putting it in motion and introducing today. Thank you again. Thank you. It was great being in conversation with you.